silver not only goes lower than gold did, going below where it started, but it takes longer before it catches up. And then when it catches up, it catches up kind of in a, in a fury. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcadia Economics. And once again, it is Monday, which means it's time for this week's Silver Report with Vince Lancey. And with that said, we'll let Vince take it away. Okay, last week, Silver was uh, sleepy, right? And it chose to ignore the behavior of both its industrial brethren, copper, and its precious half, gold. Uh, we also noted reading, seeing several articles, uh, the CNBC one, which we'll touch on, uh, a couple reports that raised our, you know, arbitrage uh, biology uh, eyebrows, and one in Russian that we're working on now. First, let's take a quick look at some of the charts to get a better feel for that information. So. Okay, great. So you have three charts. You got a chart here. And while they may be pretty, what do they mean? Okay. Top left is copper. Top right is silver. I mean, gold. Uh, bottom left is the dollar. And bottom right is silver. I tend to look at these charts counterclockwise, clockwise, lower right to uh, lower left. So silver, gold, copper, and dollar. What I'd like to draw your attention to is this is the behavior every day of the week uh, for the week. So it's five days, even though it's a four day week, uh, the spot markets and futures were open uh, during the holiday. First things first, what you'll notice from beginning to end is that all three markets were pretty much in line with the dollar. So as the dollar went up, uh, they went down marginally. And as the dollar softened a little bit, they went up. First thing I'll, I'll point your attention to is that the reaction of the markets uh, to the dollar moves was a little bit bigger than usual. And I don't want to put too much into that, except to say that uh, it may not be the dollar. It may be something else that they're looking at, and the dollar may be their uh, excuse. Uh, I mentioned the, the the Chinese yuan as being a big driver lately. Okay, but the 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 more interesting thing in here is is to take a look at silver, gold, and copper. Forget about the dollar. Silver, gold, and copper. And in each of the red sections, you had you know I have an arrow here, right? We've got silver uh, going up and then down lower than where it started during this little episode here. And you have gold going up and then down to basically where it started. And you have copper, top left, up and then down pretty much to where it started, maybe a little bit lower. All right, and, and that was all during a, a, a dump and, and spike uh, in the dollar. And what's apparent is, I like to look at these on a weekly basis, see which one is uh, relatively stronger. And silver, which had been the stronger uh, metal for months, in the last couple of weeks has gotten uh, a little bit sloppy. So uh, what you see is you see is that gold, silver, and copper go up for you know whatever reason, some nonsense you know order. And then when they come off, silver not only goes lower, not only goes lower, sticking with, sticking with gold, not only goes lower than gold did, going below where it started, but it takes longer before it catches up. And then when it catches up, it catches up kind of in a, in a fury in this, in this uh, 15 minute, this one hour bar here. So this is typical behavior of silver in an illiquid market uh, that's uh, being driven by gold flows. It doesn't move, it moves too much the wrong way. And, uh, and uh, when it does catch up, when it does capitulate, it kind of breaks hard. And we've seen that before, you know, silver doesn't move, silver doesn't move, silver doesn't move, and boom, and then it moves, you know, $1.50, you know, 7% move while gold just looks at itself unchanged. Uh, so you're seeing a micro version of that. Same thing with copper. 
right? So silver was the worst, right? It wasn't like copper and it wasn't like gold. So silver didn't attract any specialty fluid. So we're going to talk about that some other time, how gold, how silver is uh, not perfect. And so nobody sells it. It's not purely uh, precious. It's not purely industrial. So you can't pitch it to people. Let's buy an industrial metal. Let's buy gold. I mean, that silver, I mean, good. copper. Let's buy a precious metal. Let's buy gold. What's silver? Well, it's both. And unless we can really sell you hard on it uh, as a specialty item, you know, I need you to buy this pen because it writes upside down. You know, are you going to be on a spaceship? Well, then you need this pen. Well, you know, who's on a spaceship? Anyway, but I, I digress. Next. Uh, so th there's that. Silver is demonstrably weaker during the week. Why? We'll get into why in a minute. Here's another example of that. Uh, same idea, but zoomed out a little bit. You have the rectangles of the same areas, uh, and you have the same order of, of markets, and you have uh, gold stronger by the end of the week after that little rectangle, copper stronger by the end of the week, and then at the bottom right-hand side, you see silver struggling, which is just a euphemism, back to unchanged. So there's another way to look at it. Here is uh, something that uh, zooms out a little bit and gives you some perspective on what the hell is going on in the markets, okay? Uh, maybe a little small for you. You can probably pop it up on your screen a little bigger. But uh, in April, when silver started to take on water, uh, and we correctly identified that as CTA starting to pile in, worried about, just to refresh, right? CTA started to pile in short, on, in, on instruction by their advisors because the rate hike was going to be uh, bad for stocks and they didn't want to sell their stocks. So they they, they they sold silver, which is an economic one. They sold copper as well. And then sometime in October, the whole thing just started reversing. So uh, what I'm sure of is that everything started crapping out when uh, the rate hikes, the rate hike fears kicked in. And that was in April. You can see that little up top there, rate hikes kick in. There's sugar, right? There's silver on the top right, right? There's copper, top right, and there's um, iron ore futures, top right, okay? And I put iron ore in there because they're, it's very China-oriented. All right, so so stocks did similar movement, movements during this time as well. But here's, here's, here's what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is if you look at this, Everything started getting hit because of the, the perception that there'd be a, rece a recession from the Fed hiking. Uh, and then what I tried to figure out was what made it turn. This is hindsight. Uh, and what made it turn was uh, there was an article uh, written by, I'm not sure how to say his name, Nick Timaros, uh, Timaros. And uh, that article is, is essentially agreed, uh, is essentially known by people who pay attention to these things, Fed watchers, which I guess I am one, uh, that the Fed would use this guy to leak its uh, bias to kind of like do a soft sell. And it was in late October, October 20th, October 23rd, I'm not sure, where this article came out saying they started floating the, we're not going to raise rates so hard anymore. And soon thereafter, the market bottomed. And you can see what happened, right? You can see that copper rallied hard. You can see that silver rallied hard. There's, there's no variation here. Everything the same thing. But I don't have it on the screen right now, but stocks did not recover like commodities did. And the reason I'm bringing this up right now is to give you a, in a, zoom, in a zoom out. We did, the, we did the micro, right? Last week, silver did this, right? And now the macro is what's going on with relation to federal policy? And what's going on with relation to federal policy is commodities, as soon as they get a, to quote Larry McDonald, to use his word, as soon as they get a whiff of, uh, of Fed backing off the uh, brake pedal, uh, they lead the markets higher. And, you know, silver led the leaders uh, at that point. Uh, so there you have it. And that was, by the way, silver led the leaders because there was a lot more CTA short open interest. Less in gold uh, because they're not going to short gold anymore because uh, the war screwed them up. Everything screwed them up. So people aren't shorting gold as much as they used to. 
they're just they're really scared of that. Anyway, so that's it. So so the takeaway from this picture is is in the macro as you go from the daily to the macro is that that based on Federal Reserve policy behavior, commodities are leading the rallies and lagging the sell-offs, which compared to stocks, which is very consistent with China reopening. You know, the Fed's going to raise rates. Well, screw the Fed. You know, we're buying because of China. The Fed's not going to raise rates. Well, well, then we're going to buy it even more. And that's and that's uh, a nice, a, a good framework to think about it when you when you're listening to the Fed talk. You know, uh, without trying to predict what the Fed's going to do. All right. So where's that get us? Let's go to the let's go to the reports, and and the reports uh, are going to help us hopefully get a view of the week ahead. So let's see what the data tells us and if we can divine some indication as to what is going on from the various reports we've taken a look at, specifically the CTA flows and equipment to trade report. And here, here's a write-up I did today uh, on that for uh, Goldfix subscribers, but it's it's gonna serve us, it's gonna serve double purpose here. All right, and bottom line here is um, uh, going into this week, I'm, don't be surprised if we crap out and don't worry about it unless you're trading short term like I do a lot. And here's what I'm getting at, right? From the data that I've seen and the event coming up next week, and you know, believe, I would love to be wrong, guys, okay? Uh, uh, but next week, uh, well, this week, right? It's Monday. This week is very risky to have anything on. Uh, uh, if you're if you're trading, if this week, whatever happens this week, you want to just close your eyes because this week doesn't matter uh, uh, except if you're nervous about your risk during the week. This week doesn't matter in terms of the bigger picture, and it doesn't even matter in the intermediate picture. This week is China shuts down, and I have a lot of experience with this, mostly bad, uh, but but good as well, and 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 a good education on it. So. Chinese New Year has started, right? So that's on the 21st and goes through the 27th. Historically, leading up to the New Year, this is me talking, right? And I'm saying this because I've seen this and I've been taught this. And what's nice is that uh, uh, TD, T Toronto Dominion, they see it as well from a different perspective. And it's always nice to uh, see it. Of course, you gotta be careful confirmation bias. Anyway, so, what happens is, is as you go into the new year, people who have stuff to do, do it because they're going to take off for a week. So if I'm going to be buying for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be buying now, right? It's simplifying. I'm going to be buying now. I want to get my shopping done before Christmas. Same idea, right? Um, they don't always buy going into the new year, but they did this year. And there's other reasons they bought China. China Central Bank is buying, you know, Russia is going to... Uh, declare war on the dollar, all these, and all these other things are going on. Uh, and this just puts a little bit more uh, fire underneath it. So that's the first thing. Second thing is when you're in the new year, you could keep going up, you can go down, you don't know. You don't know because generally speaking, the Chinese influence is not there. And, and that means the US influence becomes more dominant, which means the bullion banks become more dominant, which means they will push the market around depending on what they want to do. And we don't know what they want to do. Don't pretend you know what they want to do anymore. Okay, so that's it. Coming out of the week, I will tell you that historically, I don't have the data in front of me, but whatever we do going into the into the uh, new year, we tend to do the opposite coming out. And that's because while there are real people buying who have to buy, there are also speculators buying. And then when it comes out, it's kind of like a news event. They sell. And that's not 100%, but there's a logic to it. Uh, I'm not making it up. That's how it happens. Second thing is from these reports are a CT here. I read this: a CTA not buying silver while gold is going up is that much closer to selling harder going down. That's the whole thing. So let me just show you what I'm talking about there. Here's here's gold, right? So without getting into the minutia of it, four days of gold trading um, in the report. Gold longs added, speculators added, speculative short, speculative shorts added as well, very small. So you probably had a little bit of shorting on, on Monday, on Tuesday, and shorting on 
uh, first day of the week, uh, Tuesday, the first Tuesday and the and the second Tuesday, because there was no Monday on this, on this. And and you probably had some covering in the middle, in the two in the two days in the middle. On the commercial side, you had 14,500 new shorts get in. Uh, and, and that's expected. If someone's buying, the banks are selling. It's not bearish, it's not bullish, it just is. What's friendly in terms of gold is that you had 11,096 new longs on the commercial side. And that's a wild card. I don't really know how to handicap that because I'm not as close to that side of the industry as I used to be. But uh, it, there's no other way to look at it except that it is uh, it is bearish. I mean, it, it is bullish. Is that Freudian? So let's go to silver. Silver is um, silver is easier to understand uh, if I spell it out for you in a, in a very clear way. The numbers mean very little, okay? Shorts covered and long sky on the fun side which means that as the market goes sideways, it finished a little higher during this four-day period, but as the market goes sideways, as silver has been, while gold's been just, just ratcheting up every day, as silver goes sideways, there are people buying silver, silver watching gold. And that's, that's everyone, not just CTAs. Longs are getting in, watching gold go up, waiting for silver to catch up. Now, you and I, we all know that silver led this rally. But, you know, if you're a short-term trader, you're not looking at the last two months. You're not a stacker. You look at the last 24 hours. Oh, gold's up. Maybe silver will go up. And so you buy silver. And that's what's happened. And you've got some people doing this frequently now. The market's been going sideways for a while. And gold's been strong and silver hasn't complied. You can argue correctly that gold is catching up to silver. That's a correct argument. However, when gold catches up to silver in normal cycles, that's the top. It's not the top yet, but silver is not complying. Now, does that make me bearish? No, but it makes me very careful. Let's go on to a little more about that. Right. Here's what TD had to say about the CFTC report. COMEX gold speculators, notably added to their length. Okay, that's gold. We're not worried about that. We know what happened there. But here's a Shanghai comment. Our track of Shanghai gold purchases stink New Year has pointed to a slowing pace of accumulation, which is what I just said, since the start of China's behemoth, I'm not sure how to say that word anymore, buying activity in early November, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here's my tentative comment to share with you all. Chinese New Year is a hazard. I already went through that, right? Why are the CTAs in silver, as opposed to just a commitment to traders report, not adding to the long side, like they used to. They are adding, but not like they used to. Well, they just got their asses handed. They went a down move. So they're licking their wounds. Plus, they're not going to get long silver like they got short silver. They don't do that because they're playing short silver against long stock. To be playing long silver when you're already long stock is not normal for CTAs. They will buy silver on a momentum move but not like they saw it. They, and this is, this is one of the reasons silver sucks when the market goes down because stock people are married to their companies and they're going to sell silver to hedge their equity flows. That's how it works. And when the market goes up, they don't buy silver because their stocks are going up. They may buy gold because of inflation, but it, silver just doesn't get it. It's like, oh, uh, I'm going to buy copper. That's industrial. Silver is too volatile. And you just see how everything works against silver in the macroeconomic moves that govern this market. And that's why I'm saying this for stackers. You don't give a shit. But you give a shit if you're a buyer. And you give a shit if you have risk you're worried about taking off in the next week or so. You don't give a shit. When the market goes, when the stock market goes up, silver doesn't comply historically because the, C the CTAs, I should say, don't comply because they're already long stocks. When the stock market goes down, CTAs shit on silver and copper because they don't want to sell their stocks and they want to hedge economic recession. That's it. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. That explains the behavior at the CTA level. Okay. So now, now that I've explained that, I want to uh, put this up there. Silver CTA behavior, this is a trader talking, cannot be seen as bullish. I better be recording this. Good, I'm recording it. 
CTA behavior cannot be considered bullish. If gold continues higher while the market is, while and, and silver moves sideways and does not attract more speculative buying, we're talking about speculation here, then the market is very vulnerable to a downside move. Why? Because CTAs aren't flat. They're long or short. They're always doing something. There's no hold in commodities. You buy or you sell. If you buy and then you hold, then you're almost selling. That's how it works, okay? So why? Because if you are a CTA and are not buying silver while gold is going up, then you are that much closer to selling one if bearish news hits. Historically, we all know this. Anyone over the age of 40 knows this. Sideways is bearish in metals, especially silver, because they run out of patience because the contango kills you. It eats your profits. That's how it works. Now, that's not necessarily true anymore, but I'm saying this. CTAs are as long as they're getting with the price here. Unless we go up from someone else buying, from a war, from silver curing cancer, from aliens that land and decide that they want to eat silver. You know, that's, that's how they eat. Well, unless you get an exogenous reason for silver going up, the CTAs are going to start looking at each other going, it's musical chairs time. They're going to start selling. And that's what's going to happen. And here's the picture to show you what I'm talking about. See this? This is fine. That's not sarcastic. Gold going up with open interest going up is how the funds always play and how the CTAs play within the funds. On the right-hand side, silver going nowhere while the green part is going up. I told you that, you know, they're as long as they get normal. Now, I'm not saying they can't get longer. I'm saying historically, this is pretty much their max. And silver hasn't moved. These people bought silver because gold, the last, that last one there, that last spike in, in, in CTA buying, those are people who bought silver because gold went up. And those people rarely get bailed out. You see this perspective. You see this in products. You see this in heating oil. They'll buy heating oil because the winter is coming and then crew goes up. And then what happens is it gets cold and the heating oil goes up and they get bailed out. Well, there's no weather in silver, right? If there's no news item in silver, then there's nothing to bail you out. And so they start getting impatient. And if gold turns down, silver, excuse my, my profanity, shits the bed. Not always, but I'm telling you, in fact, if you look at how the open interest is on the CTA side, it's spiked and gone down, spiked. Silver's kind of held its own, which means there is a buy underneath, but I don't want you to get crazy about it. I want you to think that if silver, if silver rips higher without gold moving, that's cool. And that's not, don't be surprised by it. But also think to yourself, if gold doesn't follow when silver rips in this next move, then that could be near the end. That could be the, the balloon letting that little piece of air out as it goes flat. Just be careful. Conversely, if gold doesn't move and silver starts to tweak a little bit lower, you want to see if someone's going to buy the dip in silver. And if, if silver starts to crack lower and, and gold starts to crack behind it, then it could be all bets off. That's it. So that's, that's your, your macro analysis. Let's get to uh, the more fun stuff, shall we? All right. Okay, so here's a report that I put out. Um, you're not going to hear this anywhere else until it's too late, which means I could be so early that I'm wrong. Uh, but I have some experience in M&A uh, on the analytical side. And when an industry is undercovered, people don't look at it enough, it's not marketed, you know, it's, nobody cares about it. It's like mining has been for the last, you know, five years or so. Uh, it goes through a cycle. And there's an M&A cycle. And the M&A cycle is, the stocks get cheap because the metal is cheap and you're disincentivized to start uh, spending money domestically. So I'm a big company. I'm not going to spend money if the price is down. But what I will do is I will look at other miners and say the smart big companies. I'll start looking at other miners and say, okay, uh, these guys are in trouble. The price is down. They're not making money. And I'll buy it. Or 
this is like after a tightening cycle, you see when cash is, cash is hard to get, right? And But if the price of the metal is high, I'll also look because let's face it, the, the, the major miners don't, do R, don't do R and D like they used to. They outsource it. The juniors do their work for them. And if they find something, somebody that's good, a good geology good company, boom, they pick them off if they need it. If the price of gold's going up, boom, they basically they take the financial leverage which these juniors have, right? And they say, "We'll take you in house. We'll take care of your debts." And then they take the financial leverage, and the, and the major will say, "We're going to convert it to operating leverage." Now, I don't know the miners individually, but I know that's how the industry operates. And why am I bringing that up? Because I saw a report from uh, Bank of America and they've started putting out gold reports a lot recently. And uh, I have strong opinions on that and I'm pretty confident of them. But this one, this one, while it's not a, a home run, it's not a, a done deal is, is they're looking at the industry. Now Bank of America doesn't have a history of looking at bullion. Okay, we're gonna ignore the whole fact that they're short a billion silver contracts. Uh, that's another conversation. Uh, they're short those contracts probably for a client who's long physical metal and hedging it. I don't think that's a uh, that's a bear. Uh, love to be wrong, but don't think that's a bear. Uh, so so you've got a bank that doesn't do a lot of coverage on mining. Uh, that's now done three reports on gold in the last two weeks. I don't know the individual stocks, but I'd start to pay attention to the miners that are well run and undervalued. If you're a fundamental guy, this could be the beginning of you know, a consolidation within the industry. That's it, that's it. Uh, and zooming out to leave you with this. I have uh, uh, talked several times with Chris and other people about uh, the path that we've been on since 2016. And, and most recently in the last year, starting with Zoltan, starting to really like talk about uh, alternatives to the dollar. I've been seeing the, the, the path like snap to, to, to my uh, map, my grid. And it's been locking it and, and doing quite well. And last week I was saying to myself, well, now what? You know, now, now what? Like, what's the next event? And so I started doing some research, et cetera, et cetera. And then this, this, uh, this, um, where is that? There it is. Here. This article comes out. Now I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the article itself. Okay. Uh, well, here's the, here's the headline. Silver prices could touch a nine year high in 2023 with a bigger upside than gold. Let me be, let me be, uh, an old precious metals risk manager. No shit, they could touch a nine-year high, nine-year high. They might not as well. And no shit, they'll have bigger upside than gold because that's how silver operates. This is written for five-year-olds. And then I looked at, um, and then I looked at the uh, uh, the people quoted the sources, and I went, okay, reputable, 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 fine, all one side of the table. And I said, okay. Historically, uh, I'm not a big fan of, of these sort of things. They usually occur at tops. Um, and they almost always occur at tops, but not this time. No, we'll get to that in a second. <laughs> you look at that story and people are gonna start telling you about it. I'm gonna give you the three ways to look at it. It's bullish, duh. Right, that's the the, uh, the dummy, right? And, and the little, and the little, that whole uh, Dunning Kruger thing. And then there's the second level, which is it's not bullish. It's the way I was thinking. It's like this happens, that happens, right? The the the, the clever thought. And then there's the third level, which uh, which I try to be, but it's not easy. Is um is it's bullish, and it's bullish because in, not, in no particular order of importance. Number one, we're not at a top. I mean, we're not at a top. We're, we're, we're off the lows. We're off recent lows. This is not a blow off top. We're not silver squeezing in the press. It's not happening. It's just one story. 
And all the stuff that I've talked about leading up to this one story has been lockstep with what's going on. Not predicting, just handicapping. All right, so let me just read this. It's bullish and shows the growing interest that started at grassroots all accumulating silver, silver stacking, is now being taken seriously by the press. And despite the info sources being on the producer side, which is what I just said, the banks are very aware of this and want to make money. Does that mean that the banks are looking at this going, oh, great, we get to sell more silvers? They could, they could, but you know what? No, I don't think they are. I mean, you're going to see these, these knife drops, but I don't think you're going to see them like you used to. Uh, temperatures are changing in combination with everything else. It's the next logical the stuff that I've been talking about. It's the next logical step towards metals being resuscitated as investment tools. Now, here's the tinfoil hat for you. I'm going to give you a little tinfoil hat here. All right. This is going to be out there, but I put this on Zero Hedge and uh, the crowd there liked it, but they still think I'm a little bit out there. Regardless of what happens tomorrow or next month, what's happening right now is consistent with a multi year belief. Markets are being prepared for a coming out party for broader domestic investment in real assets, not just gold and silver. The last two weeks, we've noted, you know, you see what's happened. Last two weeks, uh, uh, Spare Bank and Russian Gold, I talked about that last week, have made a blockchain gold product. It's a very special product. China announcing its gold reserves coming out publicly. I mean, are they spoofing the market to sell it? They could be. I doubt it, though. Uh, Bank of America, this is the thing I just talked about, number three, has moved the needle on gold miners to an ESG-friendly asset class. That's crazy, right? And now the CNBC are, I go, okay, well, this all could be coincidence. It really could be coincidence. And in fact, a savvy trader would say, wait a minute, silver hasn't done anything with all this news coming out. Silver is a sale. And you might be right. But I would contend the following. Since 2016, 2017, we've been following this. And there hasn't been a lot of information coming out. To the, the information started coming out in 2019 and more after 2020. But between the great financial crisis and Grexit, how silver reacted, uh, between Basel III, right, and how that got kicked down the road constantly until banks got their shit together. And then JP Morgan puts their gold uh, into its own portfolio recently, the derivatives. JPM uh, recategorizing its servitors book. Uh, Zoltan, who's been spot on in a very uh, high up way uh, on describing how gold and Bretton Woods three and the shortage of collateral, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So far, so good. Now, I read a long time ago, around 2016, 2017, and studying Chinese history, not knowing a lot of that. I'm not an expert, but but China is a state-run economy, and they use their citizens like uh, fingers on a hand. If they want to do something, they will dictate their people to it. You know, sometimes it's a disaster. Kill all the sparrows, and they end up creating a famine. But but they move as one. It's a state-controlled economy. Uh, they move as one because they're they're culturally homogenous, uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a, a strong uh, national patriotism. And there's all kinds of other things, which actually I won't bore you with right now. But, but here, here's what I'm getting at. The, 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 flip side of that is, the flip side of that is they have a lot of revolution. You know, they've had revolutions, and, and the Chinese people, from my understanding, are generally speaking uh, modest in their shows of wealth. And they like it portable, which is why gold is, and silver are just so perfect uh, for them culturally. Uh, so when you take China that knows that its people are its fingers, and then you take the Chinese people who know that gold is something that um, they want to own. Now, I'm making this up, but not crazy. And you have a Chinese economy that wants to get people on a digital currency and you have a blockchain product with gold on it now, all you got to say is, hey, everyone, buy a gram of gold on this platform and we'll hold it for you. And you have basically done an IPO. You've taken gold and you've done an IPO and you've uh, released it to the masses 
domestically. And all that gold is going to stay in the Shanghai exchange. Do I think this will happen? Yeah, I do. I do. Do I think it'll happen in a, in a, in a it will happen. Do I think it'll happen in a, in a declaration, a moment? Boom, that will happen very slowly. But I'm looking at it as a declaration. Now, why am I bringing that up? Because, because uh, it was a general uh, who said, or, or I'm sorry, it was a banker who said, China owns gold through its people. Someone asked about how much Chinese gold is there. We have this amount of tons. And the banker said, China owns gold through its people. And I went, oh, shit. And then, you know, I looked it up. So how does the U.S. own gold through its people? Well, it doesn't. Uh, it owns gold through its investors. We don't move as, as Western capitalists uh, ethnically the same way. But we all hold the same values. Constitution, rule of law, things like that. So I think that the West with the silver article and other, it's crazy stuff, right? I know it's crazy stuff. Uh, I think that the West is getting ready to unleash the investment crowd into metals. The Bank of America report is actually making the case. Now I'm not saying gold is dirty, but I'm saying it's, there's other things that are cleaner. It's actually saying that if gold miners were to mine copper, then they would be ESG friendly. It's a workaround. It's a workaround which would allow pensions like CalPERS and other big pensions to buy miners. Anyway, so what I'm getting at in big, big pictures, regardless of what happens next week, regardless of what the Fed happen, happens with the Fed, these things are going to be bought. These things have to be bought by uh, uh, the U.S. government wants people to buy it. It's like buying bonds, you know, buy bonds during the war. Anyway, crazy stuff, I know, but that's but that's where I'm coming out. Uh, bullion banks don't need precious metals. You can see what that is. All right, so so that's pretty much it. Uh, oh, here we go. Here's the other article. Uh, there's the link to it. Uh, Vetomosti.ru, uh, but I'm going to put it out uh, at some other time. I'm in the process of translating it. Uh, using Google Translate. The reason I'm interested in this article for silver purposes is this guy, I don't even, I can't even say his name. Um, Sergey, Sergey uh, Glazyev, he's important on the Russian side and he's starting to quote Zoltan and Zoltan is starting to quote him. And I'm like, that's really weird to be quoting each other on opposite sides of a wall. And so now I'm reading this Sergey guy and I'm looking for the word silver. I know what he's gonna say about gold, right? But Zoltan is selling the West, at least the Western big people on gold, and Sergei is selling the East, and he's mentioning silver. Zoltan's not mentioning silver. You got to own silver. You got to own it. You're crazy not to. It's, you know, it's, go it's going to go from, it's not it's not industrial enough to go up with copper, and it's not, it's not precious enough to go up with gold. It's going to become the shit. It's the best of both worlds. It's going to go from being, it's not focused enough to being uh, Goldilocks, just right. And that's what's going to happen. And that's my pitch. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, hope everyone has a good day and everyone has a great week. Uh, Thank you for stopping by. Well, thank you, Vince, for another great silver report. Sure appreciate that. And hope everyone watching at home found that helpful as well. Really is nice to have Vince taking over the Monday slot on the show. Before we wrap up, I would just like to thank First Majestic Silver, who brought us today's call. Again, in case you missed it, on Thursday of last week, First Majestic released their 2022 production numbers, which came in at a record annual production of 31.3 million silver equivalent ounces, which consisted of 10.5 million silver ounces, 248,394 gold ounces. They also did release their guidance for 2023, which they expect to be an even bigger year as they are looking at a range of 33.2 to 37.1 million silver equivalent ounces, consisting of 10 to 11.1 .1 million ounces of silver and the gold range coming in at 277,000 to 310,000 ounces of gold. Along with that, they're expecting the all-in sustaining cost range of 1847 to $19.72 per ounce. And the midpoint of that range would be a 12% increase over what they just came back with in 2022. 
So congratulations to First Majestic on the record silver equivalent ounce production in 2022 and the numbers for 2023. Going to wrap up for today, but again, thanks for tuning in and we will see you again tomorrow with the Physical Silver Report with Andy Sheckman.